so when I was a kid, I pictured my adult self wearing a lab coat and carrying a clipboard. I've since figured out that the lab coat is the fashion accessory of a scientist. I haven't quite figured out the clipboard, but I know when I am wearing my lab coat and carrying my clipboard, I feel very authoritative and very sciencey. I started working in labs when I was 17, so only a few short years ago. And over the years, I've worked in eight different types of laboratories, mostly to put myself through college because I paid for my own education. I've worked in mammalogy, in microbiology, and in medical entomology. So I have all of the M sciences well covered. And what I've learned from working in laboratories is that I love working in the lab. Working in labs is awesome. You get to do all sorts of super cool stuff that starts with addressing a huge problem out in the world and distilling it down to this little experimental manipulation that you can do in the laboratory. I can take a plate that has 96 wells in it, put a bunch of stuff into it in a very precise order, stick it into an instrument, and then find out how much protein there was in an organ. How cool is that? I can also use pipettes to suck up exact amounts of liquids. I can do all sorts of amazing things in the lab. And with my students, we get to present these results at scientific meetings. So we get to eat, breathe, sleep science. We get to share science with other scientists at scientific meetings. And sometimes if we're really lucky, we can publish these findings in scientific journals that other scientists can read. So in the world of science, we get to talk about all the cool things that we do. And in my laboratory, we focus on environmental toxicology or trying to understand the health effects of environmental pollutants. Now, when I was an undergrad, I obviously worked in a lot of different labs. I didn't really know what kind of science I wanted to go into. So as I said, I worked in a lot of different laboratories. Well, one semester, I had a horrible thing happen to me. I showed up for the first day of classes, and all of the courses that I had registered for the previous semester had been dropped from my schedule. And, and I won't tell you about how we had to drop and add courses back when I was an undergrad, but it involved something called the pit and going to tables where people from different colleges sat so that you could see, is there an opening in this class? Can I get added? Well, fortunately at this time, I had all of my requirements out of the way. So I could take electives, but I didn't want to take an elective that wasn't really relevant to my biology degree. So I ended up getting some courses in our Department of Resource Development. And I ended up taking a course on water management. Water management, okay, so I thought I was pretty environmentally aware. I backpacked. I was involved with a recycling organization. But taking this class made me realize that I knew almost nothing about our country's environmental history. I saw this picture in the class. This is the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, Ohio. And in 1969, it caught on fire, largely because of the pollution in the water. A river caught on fire. How crazy is that? That really made me want to learn a little bit more because when I saw that image, I thought, well, what about the fish that are living in the river? And what about the ducks? And what about people who catch the fish and eat them? What about the effects of the pollutants on them? And did people use this water for drinking? So this was a really critical point for me as an undergrad. And I only experienced it because of a mistake in registration. So I decided to take more classes in the environmental sciences. And eventually, I decided to, to, to pursue doctoral research in environmental toxicology. Now, was that, when I was in graduate school, I took a seminar on the effects of synthetic chemicals on human health. One of the books that we had to read was this book, our Silent Spring, I Almost Said Our Stolen Future, which is also a book that everybody should read if they're interested in environmental issues. So this book, Silent Spring, was published in 1962, and it was written by Rachel Carson, who at the time was a scientist for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. This book was all about the effects of synthetic pesticides on non-target organisms. In other words, the effects of pesticides on organisms that they weren't designed to target, that they weren't designed to repel or kill. In this book, Rachel Carson said, and I'm paraphrasing, if we are going to live intimately with these compounds, to breathe them, to eat them, to take them into the marrow of our bones, it is critical that we understand their nature and their power.
This book really pushed forward the environmental movement. It got people outraged about chemicals in their environment and what they could be doing to our bodies. It got the public demanding that we have protection from the government from these compounds. And for me, it was also a really big turning point. I realized that I wanted to dedicate my career to protecting human and environmental health. After I finished my doctoral degree, I made it to, in my mind, the holy grail. I did a postdoc at the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the place where environmental toxicologists go to do wonderful research. Now the EPA was born in 1970 during the Nixon administration, during a Republican administration. We perceive these administrations not to be pro-environment, but that's not always been true. One of the missions of the US EPA is to conduct research on pollutants to help us to understand them so that we can better protect human and environmental health. My position at the US EPA was funded by the Office of Water. And so part of what I did was to under, try to understand the effects of emerging contaminants in drinking water on health. Now an emerging contaminant is a pollutant that is or is thought to be in drinking water, but for which we have very little data and for which we have no regulations. Some of the contaminants I studied well, one in particular that I studied, and now is going to come the alphabet soup that is environmental toxicology, because if you want to be a toxicologist, you have to understand all the acronyms of chemistry, which is sometimes a real struggle. So one of the chemicals I studied is known as perfluorooctanoic acid, or PFOA. PFOA is a member of a class of compounds known as per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFASs. So I studied PFOA. It's a member of PFASs. Now, PFOA and PFASs in general have a lot of industrial and consumer uses. These are largely used as surfactants for making surface protection products. So nonstick coatings on pans, nonstick coatings on fast food wrappers, those are made with PF PFASs or PFASs. Stain resistant coatings on textiles, water resistant coatings on clothing, PFASs are part of the processes. Now these are extremely important compounds industrially, but as you can see from this map, they are found in drinking water sources across the United States. And let's talk about a little bit of chemistry. And this is as deep as I'm gonna go into the chemistry. PFASs are carbon chains. There could be three carbons, there could be 12 carbons, and they have fluorines all around them. The carbon-fluorine bond is extremely strong, so these compounds are extremely stable. They don't break down. Now they have different functional groups on the end. Some of them have oxygens in the middle, but for the most part, these are fluorinated compounds that are very, very stable, which means that they're really excellent in situations with high heat and a lot of chemical instability. But these very physical chemical characteristics that make them great for industrial purposes also means that they're problematic in the environment. So these strong bonds, this inability to break down, means that they're persistent in the environment. PFASs also are kind of weird in terms of chemicals because they're happy being in oil and they're happy being in water. So they're not compounds that bind into fat. They can move around a lot, they're very mobile. And this mobility makes it possible for them to bioaccumulate. So they're persistent, they can move into organisms. We also know that they can induce toxicities. They've been associated with certain types of cancer. They've been associated with effects on developing organisms. They've been associated with effects on the immune system. And they can disrupt hormones. So they do a lot of, a lot of stuff. So I've continued to study these compounds in my laboratory. And this is part of what we do. Now, a few years ago, I got an email from a firefighter. And no, he wasn't trying to sell me a calendar, although I probably would have purchased one. But I, I got, get this email from this firefighter. And one of the uses of PFASs is as aqueous film forming foams. So these are agents that are used to quench high energy fires. He had been reading about other types of PFASs and their health effects and knew that the, the AFFF he was using had PFASs in it. He emailed me and he said, 
could you tell me about these compounds? Our base safety officer said that they're not really any worse than bubble bath but I've been reading about their toxicity. We're not monitored for these compounds. We don't know if they're in our bodies. We've been covered in it. We used to clean the firehouse floor with it. I've, I've had buddies who have died from cancers that I think are associated with these compounds. Can you help me out? I'm a little bit ashamed to admit that my very first response was to go, yeah, I'm just gonna blow them off. I'm gonna send them an email that says, I don't work with humans. I don't work with human samples. I don't know anything about epidemiology. I work with experimental models. But then I thought, that's pretty irresponsible. I need to respond to this person. And I'm glad that I did, because he had reached out to other scientists, and they had blown him off. So I set up an appointment, called him, we talked for an hour, we still communicate, and I've been trying to get funding so that we can understand what these compounds are doing to him and, and all of the different firefighters, firefighters in some of the houses where they're exposed. So this kind of pushed me into an uncomfortable realm. It pushed me into an area where I had to think about humans a little bit more often. Well, now I'm gonna take us to North Carolina because I mentioned that these compounds are important industrially. Well, if they're important industrially, it means that there has to be a factory somewhere that makes these compounds. We have one in Fayetteville, North Carolina on the Cape Fear River. In 2016, a scientific paper was published with co-authors from North Carolina State University and the US EPA. They demonstrated that there were high concentrations of this new PFAS known as Gen X. Gen X is a replacement for PFOA, the compound that I studied that was eventually phased out of production. There were some other new PFASs as well. So the scientific paper demonstrated that PFASs were in the Cape Fear River. So people in Wilmington were drinking PFASs in their water. Scientific paper published in 2016. In the summer of 2017, and if any of you are from Wilmington, you're probably very aware of this, a correspondent from the Wilmington Star News named Vaughn Haggerty contributed a story about Gen X in the Cape Fear River. So he did some background research, talked to the scientists associated with the 2016 paper, and wrote a paper about this compound in the Cape Fear River. When the public found out about this, they were absolutely outraged. They were outraged that they had been forced to drink contaminants in their water. However, these are unregulated contaminants, remember? There's no rules to say that there can't be these compounds in the water. Now we do have standards for PFOA. We have a health advisory. The US EPA has said no more than 70 nanograms per liter is acceptable to drink. But we don't have that for Gen X. We don't have a lot of information on Gen X. At the time, and even now, there are only about seven scientific studies on Gen X. So we don't have a lot of information on what it does. And so I got together with some faculty from North Carolina State University, the EPA, some community organizations, and we decided we need to reach out to people in the community and study them to figure out what Gen X does to their bodies. How long does it last in their bodies? After that announcement came out, I started getting more emails. Dr. DeWitt, my son has ulcerative colitis. Dr. DeWitt, I have thyroid disease. Dr. DeWitt, my spouse has cancer. And we think it's from this water in Wilmington. We want to be part of the study. And again, I felt helpless. I don't work with people. What do you say to somebody whose spouse has cancer and who, who they, think, then they think that the cancer arose from this contaminant? What do you say to somebody whose son has a health problem and that they thought they did everything right by drinking the water? I, I still feel helpless, but I also feel very determined that the work that I do protect these individuals. This timeline was put together by a group of colleagues at North Carolina State University's Center for Human Health and the Environment. And what I want to point out is that most things with Gen X kind of came into the public in 2017. The company started making Gen X in 2009, but we have evidence to suggest that it may have been a byproduct since the 1980s. So people in Wilmington have been exposed to Gen X for decades, and we still have very little information on what to do and how to help them. Now, I said that this was all very transformative for me, and that it's kind of forced me to look at things in a different way. 
A study came out in October, published in a scientific journal that's highly cited called The Lancet. And this study indicated that environmental pollution is the world's leading cause of premature death. And the study authors estimate that nine million people each year die from diseases that they get from being exposed to environmental pollutants. Nine million people. 2016, there are nine million people in New York City. I know people who live in New York City. How many of you here know people who live in New York City? A lot of us do. So there's a high probability that each of you knows an individual who has been exposed to a pollutant and who has a disease as a result. Nine million people. So what does this mean for my research? Am I gonna stop doing what I'm doing in my lab? Absolutely not. I'm still gonna try to generate data that is protective of human environmental health. But now, instead of humans being this amorphous, sort of unfaced entity, now when I protect human and environmental health, I'm protecting Emily and Aaron and Kemp and Sam and Jackie. I'm protecting individuals and I'm gonna do everything I can in my laboratory to continue to generate data that will protect them. Thank you.